Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And in today's episode, I have a delightful conversation with longtime friend and world-leading sports photographer, Mr. Deli Carr. In this episode, Deli describes the moment at which he left the comforts of corporate life to follow his passion for sports photography. And although it took a few years, his career and his name became part of the sporting culture around the world. And Deli discusses the world of triathlon and how it has changed. And he shares some of the great, greatest moments in sport and, and some of his favorite images. Just simply a wonderful conversation with a delightful human being. Now, before we go on, thank you for listening and supporting the show. If you're enjoying the show, please share and or you can support by supporting the show's sponsors, Athletic Greens, Hyper Ice and Form Swim Goggles. They're all wonderful companies and they all have brilliant products. So please get behind them. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Delhi as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. Do you want to move better? Do you want to reach your full potential? If yes, then you should really consider Hyper Ice Recovery Tools. Personally, I use the Hypervolt and the Vibrating Roller daily. So simple, quick, and easy to look after my body at home. Hyper Ice is currently running a few sales on both the Normatec line and the Hypervolt with Bluetooth. It's a great time for anyone to take advantage of the discount. Plus, get 10% off all Hyper Ice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show code GREG21 at checkout. Go to hyperice.com, that's hyperice.com, H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com and use code GREG21 at checkout. Are you someone who enjoys swimming in the open water? Personally, I love it far more than the pool. The thing though that I miss in the open water swimming is the ability to get any feedback. But now with the Form Smart Swim Goggles, I have that covered. Whether I'm in the pool or open water, I can get my feedback. With Form Swim Goggles, you can see all your key metrics while you're swimming your distance, pace, stroke rate, and heart rate. This swim data is displayed on the goggle lens, and you can customize the display to see the metrics you want to see. The goggles track it all and are automated. You start them at the beginning of your swim, and you don't have to press any buttons in between. They automatically track everything. The goggles connect to the Form Swim app on your smartphone, and there you can review all the details of your swims. The battery life is incredible, with a one-hour charge giving you 16 hours of swimming time. So go to formswim.com forward slash Greg, that's formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off, or you can use code Greg 15 at checkout. I'm using Athletic Greens every day. Great taste, so quick and just ready to go. I've discussed Athletic Greens with several of the guests who are using it daily as well, Miranda Carfrey, Timothy O'Donnell, Tim Don, and Sebastian Kinley. You see... Athletic Greens is more than just a multivitamin and mineral. It's a delicious blend of 75 superfoods, vitamins, minerals, probiotics, greens blend, and more to support your gut health, energy, immunity, and stress. My focus is overall health, longevity, feeling good, and feeling like I'm optimizing each day. And Athletic Greens is there for me to do just that. I've also been doubling down on Athletic Greens vitamin D, a huge portion of the population are vitamin D deficient, including myself. And right now, Athletic Greens will give you a year's supply of vitamin D for free and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Please do yourself a favor and sign up. It also makes a great gift for a family member or friend. So sign up now and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. All right, today's guest is arguably the greatest sports photographer in the world. Officially ranked in Australia as Australia's top freelance sports photographer, his list of clients reads like a who's who in the world of sport. From swimming to rugby to triathlon and fencing, softball and rowing, he's worked them all, plus seven Commonwealth Games and nine Olympics, with 2021 Tokyo Olympic Games being his 10th. But he's much more than a photographer. He's a man who's captured and preserved the history of some of the greatest moments in sport, the victories and the triumphs and the disappointments and misfortunes, the laughs and smiles and blood, sweat and tears. He's captured it all. His awards read like their own book. If there's an award for the most awards, this man's probably has it. The highlight being a member of the exclusive World Photography Academy. He's been a mate of mine since the late 80s, early 90s, and I've always loved his passion and commitment to doing whatever it takes to celebrate the story of sport. It's a huge honour to have him on the show. So welcome, 
And thank you for joining me on The Greg Bennett Show, Mr. Deli Carr. How are you, mate? I'm good. That was a pump up and a half. I loved it. <laughs> um, you've almost got me teary. Wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, It's been one of my highlights of this show is actually um, – with each of the guests kind of just looking at what they've done and just mentioning it at the top of the show. I mean, it really is just, you know, you, you've you accomplished a lot. You've been around a while. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you and I, I think I think we were talking pre-show about I think the first shot you took of me was Tari Triathlon, 80, maybe 90, 89, 89, I'd say. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I started in 88. And I, that doesn't sound like a long time ago, but it is. It's 34. 35 and, and a bit years, whatever. Um, yeah, the first one was of you. You were a skinny little runt uh, in 89 in Tari. Um, it's funny, isn't it? It is. That, that, that photo, I mean, we have to find it. I know I know you've looked through your archives, but one of these days we've got to find it. And if anybody has the 1989 Australian Triathlete magazine, <laughs> it has me on a bike with this, this storm cloud behind. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't know did where. find it the other day. I found it, or not the other day, a few months ago. Um, I spent most of that last year looking back through my files and digitizing all the old film stuff. Mm. And uh, that mm. one came up. I always set that one aside as I really love that photo. Um, oh. Yeah, so that it was funny. I went to that triathlon. No one still knew me all that well. And um, I had my cousin drive me around the course because – no one knew who I was and race organiser didn't care for me and so forth. So um, we got in a car and drove around the course and that's when we got to this hill and you guys were all coming up this long country hill and there was that dirty big storm on its way. So, yeah, think, um, things have changed since then, but uh, I was doing it old school then. Yeah, it was all old school though, wasn't it? I mean, I, I think, you know, when we look back at that late 80s, early 90s era, and, and looking specifically at triathlon, it was like every country town in Australia decided to put on a, a triathlon. You know, for people that don't know, uh, Taree is about oh, three to four hours north of Sydney, um, but along that east coast there from Kempsey and Crescent Head and uh, Coffs Harbour, there was just all these tiny triathlons that just lit up um, totally where we agree. all got to hone in our skills, you know, over those many years. Totally agree. It, it, they all embraced it in some way or form. It, and, and that was the beauty in, of, of its infancy, of how personal that sport was. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, if I look back at the real early files, there are none in the, There are no races in the major capital cities and so forth. Um, mm. They were they were country towns. We all were lodging in little motels and you know eating at the local pub. Um, things have changed. Yeah. I, there's been certain Insane. steps in the sport that the professionalism, and rightly so, has jumped. So we mm. were racing, you know, underneath the opera house and all that. So things things slowly evolved from those days. I know it's been fun to watch it evolve, hasn't it? Just the sport grow and, like you said, become more professional. And every now and then we can kind of reminisce about the good old days kind of mm. thing. But it's really great to see where the sport is and and I think you know the ITU and getting into the Olympics really accelerated the professionalism probably more than anything we've seen. Um, yeah, it, it's it's know. true. I I don't begrudge the sport being where it is. I you're right. I would love to go back to the good old days and and have the fun as a young man like you and I both did. But mm -hmm. you know, jumping up. Well, we had that era of professionalism you were a part of, which was the Grand Prix series in Australia, which mm. in my eyes revolutionised the sport, changed the ITU's way of thinking and and it and it came for the good. So yes, they're now on the Olympic stage there, you know, you need security and passes and so forth to get into an event and you know, it it's all done by the book now. But I just went to the Luke Carrip triathlon three or four weeks ago. Mm. And that was a step back into the eighties and nineties. It was calm. It was it was easy to walk around. People were having fun. Um, you know, there weren't there wasn't that. It was a nice, calm country town atmosphere again, and I enjoyed that as well. But I also mm. enjoy stepping onto the big stage and watching the the athletes now uh, race as they do. 
Mm. It's interesting. You know, you you have just such the experience now. Do you ever get the younger photographers saying, hey, Delhi, can I, you know, pick your brains on, on how to operate at an Olympic Games? Or, I mean, you're coming up to your 10th Olympic Games and, you know, add that with your Commonwealth Games, which is much the same mm. for people that don't know. Um, you know, do you get the younger photographers saying, hey, Delhi, do you mind sort of Show me around a little bit. Yeah, of, of course. That happens all the time and, and I'm happy to do that. And I had mm. a mentor very early in my career, um, a photographer that always pulled me aside and told me what to do, or how to do things. And, and I really appreciated that. So I do what I can when I can. Um, mm. I obviously can't take someone along to the Olympic Games. That's a different deal. But at a race <laughs> where I can, a Malula bar or whatever, yeah, let I'll talk it through with them. It's funny, mm, the sport, mm. the day I finally um, put down the camera and put my feet up, the sport's in good hands with photography anyway. They've they've all seen my work. They've all tried to imitate my work and, and my work ethic. Um, mm. There was a saying uh, with a lot of photographers when they're at an event and um, they're not quite sure what to take a photo of and they 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 ask themselves a the question is what would Delhi do? <laughs> and so that they always stop for that one, you know, one minute and go, what would Delhi do now? And that's that's what they've all been trying to achieve this standard that I've I've set. Um so yeah, as the day that I retire, there's a whole lot of mini delis coming along and we'll be able mini to delis. carry it on. <laughs> but the thing is you keep reinventing yourself. I mean, it's not like what would Delhi do today? Well, yeah. you come out, you could be at the same event and you've come out with a whole spectacular new way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah, it's, I, mean, I guess that's been partly being a creative, Greg. Mm. Um, in any sort of creative field, whether you're a painter or, or you arrange flowers for a living or whatever, you, you see things and you, you learn by your mistakes, but you learn by your successes and your creative brain matures. Um, mm. I feel my best works my last 10 years, you know, not that my first 25 were poo-poo, but I look back at some of my early work and I said, oh, well, I may not have photographed it like that This, mm. if I had to sh- take that same photo now. So mm. it's, it's the creative brain. Um, you've got a sporting brain. So you, I'm sure, as a sports person, matured and learned things by experience the whole way through. Right? And you mm. became a better triathlete or a better athlete as, as time went on. And I feel that my world has changed or my brain, my thought pattern has changed like like an athlete would. How, how much of it do you think is, you know, we look at this in sport and I've talked about on this show a bit, you know, talent or natural strengths, if you like, that we're all sort of born with. And, and then we have the work ethic sort of piled on top and, and perhaps opportunity is the third and final piece to that. But mm. How much of what you do and, and, and your success that you've had has been you have some creative genius in your DNA versus this 35 years of practicing and repracticing and performing? Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, you, uh, you hit it perfectly, Greg. I mean, in all professions, in everything, there is – it's inbuilt in you. It's part of your soul. Mm. Um and then, yes, it's, you know, the experience and then the opportunity, as you said, and the time. It's definitely, it is definitely part of me, and, and I didn't realise that, but uh, certain times in my whole career I've realised that, uh, look, the past year, you know, sitting at home for 11 months without work, mm. I've realised how much I miss my work. Um, mm. I also did miss the people, don't get me wrong. I, I missed my whole worldwide friends of, in the world of triathlon. But, mm. yeah, I missed picking up the camera um, and taking pictures. And, and I did a few creative things in that time, but photography kept coming back up to the top. So it is part of my DNA. You know, mm-hmm. I, was, I was led to believe, I'm pretty sure all my circumstances throughout my life that, you know, I came to this, this point in time. Um, all those things that happen define me as a photographer, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, you come from a very, I mean, you have an artsy family, right? I mean, you're, 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 you're the photographer, 
yeah. uh, your wife, um, forgive me. Yep, yeah, Leanne, and, then, and she's, Leanne, yeah, oh, she's me, a, works at the Art Gallery in New South Wales as, yeah. as an education you, person. I now have two kids. And how mm. old do you reckon they are now? Let me try and Jeez. test your knowledge. I remember, gosh. She, my little one would come are to they, the races they're, early on. They're not, they're not teenage. Are they still teenage? They've no. gone past that. Uh, <laughs> eight, eight, well, how old? How old I have are they? a 25-year-old and a 19-year-old now, and, and yes. both of them are creatives. They, I mean, from two creative parents, we were never, we were never going to have a, a brain surgeon <laughs> or a rocket scientist. So um, both of them are going to go into creative fields. I, I can see it. Uh, they won't be photographers, but when they both have picked up a camera, you know, I'm out, you know, I'm gobsmacked by what they actually produce. So, wow. um, yeah, like we just said, it's part of the DNA that um, I guess that was the environment they were brought up. They were brought up in a creative environment. That's what they see. That's what they love. Yeah, it's incredible when you when you talk about the DNA. It's a bit like our kids aren't going to be rocket scientists or brain surgeons mm. either. <laughs> it's, it's, but there's a very good chance it's like watching our daughter who's now three yeah. and she literally is a fish to water. Yeah. I mean, she, I taught her to swim um, using uh, Laurie Lawrence's swim school program yeah. on, online. So any, anybody who's got young kids, go check that out. He's a, a very good online program for teaching your kids to swim anyway did that and honestly by 18 months she was already swimming yeah. um by two she's swimming laps <laughs> and now it's, it's it's just but it's that in a dna i think it's a natural feel for swimming biking and running almost yeah. and it's, it's kind of funny to watch that what we pass on um now look i want to i want to shift gear here a little bit okay. um i decided to have you on the show even though you said to me several times throughout my career i don't take a great photo Let's dive into that. <laughs> what does that oh, mean? Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I should. Did we have a couple of wines that night when I opened it? <laughs> there are some athletes that you can't take a bad photo of, and, oh, and Glorious yeah. Laura was one of them. She mm. always looked good. But you, you were one of the ugly ones, and I mean it in a nice way. Um, yeah, Lee, I only take it in a nice way. I think it's a I, in all my sports, like in swimming, there are some athletes I won't. They're in lane four; they're going to win the race, but I won't take a picture of them because they're ugly swimmers, and I mean that <laughs> photographically, they don't come up well. But let's say Kate Campbell can't take a bad picture of that woman, like whatever mm. she does. But mm. yeah, there there are some athletes that come up well, and you were one that. Okay, you, I'm not sure. That was your running style or whatever it was, but it, the, um, you know, for some reason, I thought you were an ugly, ugly racer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I actually, I don't take that as a bad thing. I, I think it. Uh, I take it as a. I was grimacing the entire way, you were. Or, I, or I was too relaxed, and my face was, you know, my cheeks were were flapping everywhere. Yeah, Who knows what it is? Well, but I always felt like I always said to you, you should take a photo of my heart and lungs because <laughs> that's the only thing that matters. That's, that's funny, <laughs> and, and yeah, I was trying not to offend you in any way, but I, I don't know how to put it to words. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. It um, it might have, it was the way you raced, and and it didn't come across well on on a still, but it may have come. May have looked beautiful on a video. I, I didn't take video, but uh, and <laughs> as I said, Laura, was, I'm Laura, Laura I couldn't take again. a bad picture of, right? Like, exactly. Well, remember you sent us. Oh, this is a great story. If you, I hope you don't mind me sharing. But I went to do the 2007 Beijing World Series race. I was mm. heavily focused on the US racing, um, mm. but I thought I'd go over and support Laura. It was her Olympic trials. Anyway, I think, was it 07? No, I can't remember. Anyway, I false started and I'm clearly laid out and you have a great photo of it. Like every single guy, the 80 guys on the pontoon are standing there. I know my hands are already in the water. <laughs> I, might, I, I was really hoping to really have a great start, but I, I overdid it. It was too good um, to start. Anyway, I, my story is that basically I got beaten up on the swim anyway, got beaten up so bad that I end up coming out of the water last by over two minutes. Wow. And I remember running up to the bike and the guy said to me, look, I'm, I meant to give you a, a stand down penalty, but you're so far behind. I'll just let you go. <laughs> anyway, Laura, on the other hand, had a fantastic race, led the swim and it was a too late swim. And she has this photo. And again, I'll put this in show notes of her 
laid out on diving in on the second lap with this um, ch- uh, Chinese temple mm. in un- almost underneath her in the background. Mm-hmm. And you sent an email after the race with the two photos and just said, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Beauty and the Cheat. I'm sorry. Beauty and the Cheat. Oh, you know what I cheat? Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Well, it was. I was cheating. I got a full start. It was called Beauty and the Cheat. It was one of the best Jeez, emails I've We must have got on well for me to say things like that. Anyway. Uh, absolutely. Well, we're Isn't it funny, but you two, you two for a long time, you, I almost became your personal photographer. You you both did your hmm. marketing so well as a as a the couple and the fit couple and the respectful couple and you did everything right. And I was your photographer and remember all the magazines were asking for photos mm. of, of you two. Mm. And um, so, yeah, the beauty and the beast on every cover of every magazine around the world. It was, it was funny. You were, you guys were hot. Yeah. We were hot there for a little while. It's like every. It's like I tell a lot of the athletes: you get to rent being the best for a little while, yeah. and then the world moves on. You never own it; you just get to have it for a little bit, a nice taste. And you pass and then, it on, correct? But it was always, you know, we were we always had uh, whatever sponsor we were working with, and or, or magazine, we'd always say, you know, go reach out to Delhi. Yeah. We, we need Thank him on you. our board. I think I think the last magazine shot was with Laura, and you came up to Noosa, and you had a running on the. On the the rock wall yeah. up there on Noosa Main Beach, we were fantastic. I remember that. that. Yeah. Um, again, I'll put these in the show notes for people that think, "Well, hang on, Greg, what are you talking about?" But um, <laughs> just some beautiful shots. Um, let, let's rewind the clock a little bit, mm. just so we can get to know you a little bit. And and this is interesting for me because I have known you for thirty plus years, but I I don't know the Delhi story as well as I'd like. Sure. Um, so tell us about your, your journey into photography, you know, how old were you, where were you living and, and what was that like? Okay, I'll try not to make it boring, but um, <laughs> my very first recollection of photography is, is mum and dad buying me a little camera for a school excursion. I think I was seven or eight at the time. Um, it's a little plastic camera. They, I know where they bought it from because I still have it and I have the box and it was Woolworths. And no it cost 99 cents. So um, I don't know what the going rate for cameras were then, but either Dad was a cheapskate or he, he bought me a standard <laughs> camera. <laughs> but it, it's funny because I, I still have this camera and if you try and buy it on eBay, it's worth a bomb. Um, all the artistic <laughs> photographers tend to use it um, <laughs> because it's not perfect and that imperfection in the picture makes it look arty. So mm. I, I what laugh. Is it called? What do you it's call that the camera? Diana F. Diana F. Yeah, the Diana, and the Diana was uh, popular. It was from Hong Kong. It was a cheap, uh, nasty version of the old Kodak Brownie. Mm. So that my first recollection, and then Mum and Dad were both migrants. They came to Australia, the wonderful country, and they worked hard. Dad worked the two jobs and to build a life and a home for us. And they they made me study hard so that I I didn't have to work you know hard shitty jobs somewhere. So um, you know I I got great marks at high school, went to university, did an economics degree, uh, majored in marketing, and, and I stepped into the corporate world. Hmm. So I wore a suit and tie for many years in various industries and um, company car my own secretary, office with harbour views. You know, I had the kit and caboodle going. Um, but all through that time I was going and taking photos, sports photos, because that's the passion that I had. Um, I loved photography and I loved sport and we're marrying the two together. So, you know, nine to five, Monday to Friday in, in a suit and tie and then on the weekend trying to take pictures and learn about it. My mm. company, this was now 87, I think, roughly. Mm-hmm. Um, my company was handing out uh, retrenchment packages. If anyone wanted to leave, they weren't doing that well. And after a discussion with Leanne, we, I decided to jump out of that safe world and into freelance sports photography. So I took mm. the retrenchment package and I left and... That was the start of it. Um, so mm. that's 87 roughly. And, yeah, it, it, 
it was a lean few years, you know, eating Vegemite sandwiches for dinner and whatever, but slowly but surely my work evolved. Um, mm. I was lucky and blessed to step into the world of triathlon in 88 by sheer accident. I mean, that's another story as well. <laughs> but um, when Sydney got the Olympics in the early 90s for the 2000s, that's when work picked up here and, and Delhi rode up with that. Um, mm. You know, people were sponsoring athletes. There was – we was sport events were all over the place, so magazines were popping up everywhere. So I grew with that, you know, mm. influx of sport in this country. Triathlon at that time too, we got the Grand Prix Series in the 90s, the early, mm. you know, leading into 2000. And then my work in triathlon went around the world because – there was a new sport, you know, a new format in the sport and everyone around the world and all the magazines around the world wanted my pictures. I was the only guy shooting triathlon at that time. Hmm. There was one other photographer, Jero Honda in Japan, but I was the Australian hmm. guy and everyone got to know me that way. So it was – I had to jump out of my safety zone from a, a corporate job and, you know, good salary, et cetera to do something which was part of my DNA, as we said, that mm. I got so much joy and love out of photography. Um, I, I didn't I, enjoy I, the corporate world at all. I, I love the the jump. You know, it, it's like we all often sit back and ponder and wonder if we did this or did that. And, you know, I often ask on this show, when did you go all in? You know, when, mm. when did you pull the trigger? Because it's pulling that trigger, jumping all in with everything you've got. That's scary as hell, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and 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 for you, it wasn't a gradual thing. For a lot of athletes, it's a gradual process. You know, mm -hmm. you're enjoying the sport. Suddenly, somebody gives you a paycheck. Maybe, you know, for me, it was like a rebel sport said, you know, you're pretty good. Here's a couple of, you know, five grand or whatever. And you get this kind of, and you build into it. Um, but for you, it's a really, it's really, I have a tremendous amount of admiration. I really do because I think you're leaving the comfort and it's like we call, you know, comfort's a drug. Yes. You know, it, it, this, you become so comfortable that you, you, you can't move and, you, and you're paralyzed and you don't do anything else that you truly love. And I love that you just followed your passion. Were you somebody that enjoyed sport yourself, playing it yourself yeah, growing up? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't good at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up in the old rugby league and, uh, you know, the rugby league area of South Sydney. So, you know, it was all rugby league when as I grew up. But my dad had a lot of sports he loved and oh you know i went along with that he loved boxing um so mm. boxing i loved to watch um you know i love the rocky movies all that sort of stuff mm. that whole mm. old school world um dad loved basketball and i played basketball for a while but you know i'm not the tallest person in the world so i, I was the little <laughs> point guard that would direct the traffic as opposed to scoring goals so um, mm. I played sport, yeah, and I love sport and I love the psyche of sport. And um, so, was I the? I'm the best armchair sportsman in the world. I'll, I'll watch any sport that's on on TV. Um, you and me both. Yeah, you and me any both. Sport. Anything done well, any anything sport. done well, it's just great to watch. Totally it really agree. is. And and I've been mm. blessed by, you know, I people know me as the triathlon photographer, but you know, I shoot a lot of sports and I get to see athletic feats that you just go, wow. Um, you know, or you look at someone psyching up for a race and how they do it differently to someone else or how someone accepts defeat. Um, you know, I love looking at that up on the fly on the wall that's watching all of this. Uh, mm. And there are times where I'll put the camera down and I'm just watching it with my eyes and, and soaking it all up. Um, I, I, did, I did want to ask, actually, I have that on my notes. Is, has there been a moment where... A sporting moment's just been so overwhelming that you've either forgotten to snap or you just refused to snap. You just wanted to, you know, is there anything that really stands out to you like that? Yeah. I, I, the night Kathy Freeman ran um, mm. at the Olympic Games and off she went around the one lap and I was watching the whole thing. I, I didn't pick up the camera until she was like 10, 15 metres from the finish line. I went, shit, I should be taking this picture. <laughs> the, the atmosphere and the noise and the, the pressure that must have been on that girl and 
Mm. I mean, that's still my number one moment in my career. But mm. I only took photos right at the end. Um, another moment I can remember is is Emma Snowsill winning gold at um, the Beijing Olympics. Mm. And she's been a friend like you for all these years and I've, you know, watched her grow and mature as an athlete and here's a friend of mine about to win an Olympic gold medal and I'm watching her crossing the line and, shit, I should have been taking photos of that as well. You know, I I took that one personally. I didn't – the work, Delhi, you know, was pushed aside for this mm. friend, you know, that, that just won mm. a gold medal. It was the same for Simon in Sydney 2000. I mean, you and I and he, we used to go to the pub at, at Neutral Bay there at the – um, the Oak. at the Oaks and mm. all of a sudden a few years later this guy's winning a gold medal at the Olympic Games in my hometown and you know that was just like oh my god and this this is what triathlon does to me I watch people winning races or winning gold medals and they're all friends they're not athletes to me mm. Mm. Um, well, you, well you've worked with all of them so much I mean you, you, you touched on earlier the Grand Prix in Australia. For listeners that don't know, the Grand Prix went on for almost 10 years, I think. But the, definitely the first five to six years, it was live television, all super short format style of racing. Chris McCormack's now got, now got a series called the Super League Triathlon, yeah. which is much the same as that. Um, what was really unique and special about that series was it, it wasn't just racing. It was a community. Mm. And... It was, and what I mean by that, it was the athletes didn't just come down from their hotel room, do a, do a race, and, and go back. Mm. We were all, we all knew we were some, a part of something bigger than just the individual. We were part of a, an event, and every piece of that puzzle mattered. And the athletes, the race organizers, the media, the photographers, the the course organizers, every every part of it, we all worked incredibly hard together to make sure it was a really special event. And you know some of the parties that we had mm. post race quite often after each race not just the end of the series you know <laughs> it was a for us athletes it was a time where we got to know the photographers we got to know the media and the the race organizers personally yeah and we were all in the journey together and i think that was what really separated that time and that series almost more than any other period in my career anyway was it much the same for you it was you also did forget you forgot to mention the pre race parties as well but <laughs> We were a little out of control, but but you were right. Um, we were all, up, and I was your age at the time or just a little bit over, and we were all the same age. The promoters were all a little bit older but not much older than us. So there was a band of brothers, the whole thing, and I might have been the photographer, but I'd help put the bunting up some mornings and, mm. you know, mm -hmm. athletes would help each other and, yeah, we had all dined together and eat together and um, it was more, it was a community and it might have been a bit, it was a band of brothers to me mm. um, and, and that included the ladies. I don't know how the right way to say that as well. But in saying that, all of us together, um, mm -hmm. we, were, we were achieving something at that particular time and I still feel um, what, Adam and Fraze and what Damo did at that point in time was was turn the sport completely around. It's definitely a defining mm -hmm. moment in the sport. Couldn't agree more. So, and, and and I think even the athletes I've had on that did that series are very quick to point out that that was uh, our moment to learn professionalism, our moment to s step up quickly from being yeah. just somebody that you know does the taree triathlon on a weekend it was okay this is live television um and it was intense and 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 i think that really did help a lot of us go on to have long careers yeah. because we were it was that baptism of fire we just threw us in <laughs> and said Here you're you go. all properly media trained the tv worked with you guys it was mm. a share it was complete sharing amongst all of us with whatever we were good at we would share that with others and you're right it, it added so much more. I mean, it's a different world today. The, the, the top league, the ITU World Series, the athletes, sadly, I feel, don't have that particular social aspect to it mm -hmm. yet. But we have now progressed in sports science. We've now progressed in nutrition. 
rest the whole thing compared to what we <laughs> grew up with. So that's true. You can't. Com- it's like with most sports. You can't compare era after e- against another era. No. Um, it's a totally. But but where triathlon is now is wonderful. Where it was mm-hmm. was wonderful as well. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree. But yeah, but you, you know what? I mean, look, we're we're lifelong friends, right? And that that's it came from those series. Mm-hmm. What is it, how, Absolutely. that many years ago? Thirty years ago. I know, I know it's crazy to think. And about. we were thinking of a thirty-year reunion. A few of us were talking, so um, that may still happen. But none of us got off our butts <laughs> to do anything. Reunion. Two is blue Grand Prix. Two is blue. Yeah, right. You had a sport 94. sponsored by a beer company. Yeah, it's you know, big, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it says yeah. a lot, right? You know, that's how it was. So uh, you have to give credit to the to the Bray brothers and Frey's there that went outside of the box and found a beer sponsor or found other people that were interested. Um, it was amazing. Yeah. You know, what, you know what separates you, though, I think, from a lot of the photographers and the creative genius that's out there is, is your ability. Well, I was going to lead with that. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to say is you have great people skills and you understand it's a business. And, and that's is that because of your economics and, and the marketing background that you understand that to be a photographer, to work on your own is to be an entrepreneur, to entrepreneur and, and to work with others. You've always seemed to me to have the business mindset and the creative genius work together. Would you agree? Yes. Um, we, uh, we also got to go back to the way that I was brought up with Dad mm. and it's about respect and good manners and a few other things as well. Um, mm. But, yes, the marketing degree helped me definitely. And I guess with all creatives and particularly those that make a lot of money, um, they've got to be 50% creative, 50% business person. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, of, of course, it, I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't still be doing what I'm doing at my level if I wasn't earning money. So there are times you have to put the creative person aside and you shoot for your client's reasons. It may not be a creative one, but you shoot with that sign in the background that has a sponsor's name or they need a particular shot for their annual report, et cetera, Mm. et cetera. So, yeah, if you manage to get a spare minute in that time, then you do your creative work. And the- I, was going, I was going to ask you that, like how much when, I mean, it probably depends on the client you're working with. I mean, for people that know Delhi car mm-hmm. and they know the name, they probably, they're coming to you and saying, Hey, we know you have come with a creative side. Yes. Um, yes. And, and, and is that kind of negotiated in your, in your contract? Look, we need to have, make sure we just, can you just hit these couple of things, but then go, go for it. What's Correct. that like? Yeah, you, my, yeah. my client, my my shot list for swimming, for argument's sake, is let's make sure we get these things and then go mm-hmm. crazy. Um, <laughs> look, Lorraine Barnett, the ITU, um, mm. when I started working for them, um, she pulled me aside at dinner one night and said, um, you realise we've employed you because we want you to photograph it according to Delhi. We want you to photograph the sport like no one else has. Mm. So do it mm. in your own eyes. So my brief with the ITU from the beginning was just go for it and love shoot it, it according to you. Too. Now, Good on wonderful it. words mm. for saying that. Um, mm. and, and it was funny because I would shoot an ITU race and, you know, the pictures were released that weekend in whatever form and I would always be thinking, now, what is Lorene thinking? Is it good enough for Lorene's standards? So Lorreen was like, what would Lorreen like? That mm. I would always ask my que- that question while I was shooting. Mm. So the, well, that, well, that was a blessing. And how, how long have you been with the ITU now? Um, when did I? About 94, 95? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was later than that. It would have been just before 2000. I see about as long as I was. I mean, yeah. I, my first... Uh, IT World Championship was 94 mm. in Wellington, New Zealand. And then I think it was Cancun the year after, Cleveland the year after that. We were going through them the other day with my father-in-law mm-hmm. who's been around. But, you know, I've always been impressed. I mean, you're an ambassador for Nikon, uh, Thule, Subaru, mm. 
you know, how did these partnerships start? Did they reach out to you um, they, or, and, and how are they going now? Has is, is it, is it progressed? They're all still there. Um, Nikon's 11, 12 years, Subaru's 8 or 9, mm. uh, Tulay's very, or just Tule. a little bit under that as well. Um, mm. All right, Nikon, you know, you could expect something like that if you're good at what you do. Australia yeah. was the first with an ambassador program, so um, I, the band of seven of us that they chose of different genres were the first in the world and all the other Nikon companies around the world followed. So I was their mm. sports person and um, Subaru came on later. They they were sponsoring a few triathletes at the time, but they wanted a, a step out of the box and wanted someone involved in sport, but there was not an athlete, but yeah. heavily involved and was a good person. And that's my name was thrown into the hat. So yeah, some people would say, well, "Why why are you an ambassador for a car?" But there are many reasons why a a car is important to me, but. They chose someone that works in sport and they still have a touch within that sport. So that's where I come up too late, the similar sort of thing. So mm. it, these three, also I do remember Nikon saying, yes, we do want good photographers, but we want someone that's a good person. Mm. Um, so all three are for that reason. Um, as well as doing what I do and I do it well, um, one has to be a nice person as well respectful, all the good things, the good manners, has a good well, reputation. They've chosen the right person, mate. Well, they're, thank they're, you. Um, I think, uh, and I think there's a lot to that. I think uh, I love the fact that these companies are, are looking beyond the normal kind of sponsorship, yeah. you know, the athlete kind of model and or the entertainer or whatever it is, and actually going, well, hang on, who's the one that's actually physically sharing that story? Yes. Because without a photographer, that story is not being shared. Yeah. You know, it's one of the, the great things about a photographer or a writer, a journalist, is the one that's actually sharing the story, yes. a commentator. Um, the, these people that, sure, the athlete's doing the work and they have to go on the course and perform and blah, 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 blah. But if we don't have the media with us, if we don't have great promotion, then it just falls flat. Yeah. And, and it's like I said in the introduction, you know, you've, you've got the history of the sport You've captured it of not just the triathlon, of swimming and fencing you've seen and um, there's just numerous if mm. we go through your, your resume. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you've worked with some of the, the biggest teams in the world. Mm. I mean, the Australian swimming team is one of the biggest teams in the world mm. and you've been contract. And I, I, I want to read this quote that I read from the former CEO of uh, Swimming Australia, Lee Russell, and uh, she said, to work with professional sports people in the inner sanctum when they often are at their most vulnerable or in the most significant moments of their lives, takes a special personality and a professional skill. Delhi is our trusted fly on the wall and over many years has captured our success and our challenges, our dreams and our aspirations and moments that have inspired a nation. Delhi is our go-to and always goes above and beyond for the team, working hard behind the scenes to capture and preserve sporting history as it happens. I mean, how does that make you feel? Yeah, it's a, I just got quite a rap. I got yeah, it is a big rap, and it, it I just me. Got it gives my head standing on and reading that. It's so well said. It it, um, it it is a little two way, and once I get the respect of an athlete or a sport, um, I'm allowed into places that no one else would be. Um, mm. So that gives, that shows. Then I can photograph these moments. Let's let me. I realised this um, at the sad passing of Jackie Gallagher. Um, mm. We went to the church um, and the, the little mass booklet was given out and um, there were a lot of photographs of Jackie's career which they asked of me to put in the booklet, which was fine. I realised during that service that I document a particular time in a young person's life where they're fit, mm -hmm. They're young, they're athletic, they're invincible. Um, you know, I wish I had photos of me in my 20s doing the crazy <laughs> things I did, right? You know, yeah. nowadays I struggle to walk up a flight mm. of stairs. But I, I document a really important time of your life, mm. you know, Laura's mm. life, every athlete, um, that I hope that one day 
when they have their kids or their grandkids that they show these pictures to their children and say, this was me in my 20s and I was winning a gold medal and, and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, I take that responsibility quite, you know, I take it on. And um, you're right, I, I record history. Last year when I was doing all my archiving of all my pictures and digitising the real important stuff that was still on film, Mm. Um, I realized, okay, that was a shot of Kathy Freeman running, but it is now part of history in this country. Um, mm. It's a doc. It, a, she was the great athlete, and you look at her running style and you realize why she was. And then, you know, all the shots of Greg Norman and the Pat Rafters that I have, and all, you know, John Eels, all these period of history, Australian sporting history. These pictures are now invaluable. They're not just, mm. you know, I've got shots of footballers kicking the ball you know, in rugby league and, oh, my God, he's now one of the immortals in the sport. Who knew that at the time that this young kid would be? So, you know, I've got shots of you as a skinny little run, you know, <laughs> at a Tari restaurant, you know, Tari triathlon, and then, you know, you became – you know, one of the greats in Australian triathlon sport. You know, who was to know that? I've got shots of Emma Snowsill as a little kid, you know, running mm. to become one of our greats as well. So you know, it, it really is uh, incredible. Are you somebody that – are there certain sports that you – well, I guess drawn to, but then you must – to understand the emotions and, and what's going to happen next, are you somebody that really studies and has to prepare – um, yeah. you know, what, what happens first? Is it a love of sport or is it you kind of find an event, you know, they reach out to you and you quickly got to try and learn what yeah, that event's I, about? There, there is a love of sport. and Well, that, that's one step, but there are a few more after that, obviously. And look, mm. I, I was official photographer for the World Netball Championships here in Australia a few years back. I sucked at netball because, A, I'd never played. I'd never had a sister that played. I not even watched a game before that. So you need to know the sport, definitely. Um, um, so, yeah, if you chuck me out in front of a rugby league game, I know the sport. I've watched it since I was a kid and mm. played it at high school and so forth. Um, but but it, what about something like fencing? I mean, it was that a random? How did that? that you've got yeah, that was maybe the old school. Stuff. I love shooting sports that are a bit more traditional, the sumos, the fencing, those. Uh. So... That's a little, you know, the old school boxing. Um, mm. That's a bit of me, my old school me um, coming out. But do I know fencing all that well? No, there's stuff that I miss. I continually shoot fencing because I do love the sport and now it has a special meaning to me, uh, mm. winning awards and a few other things. Mm. But I I loved, there was a genuine passion for fencing because they still do all the instructions in French. Um, they still dress the way they are. There's no sponsors logos on their uniforms. So it's, it's fencing as it once was all those years ago. A quick mini break. I really want to encourage you to do something special for yourself and sign up for Athletic Greens and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. If you want to see all your key metrics like your pace, distance, stroke rate, and heart rate while you're swimming, you need the Form Smart Swim goggles. Go to formswim.com forward slash Greg. That's formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off. Or you can use code Greg15 at checkout. Take advantage of the great sale going on now at Hyperice. Plus, get 10% off all Hyperice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show discount code GREG21 at checkout. Go to hyperice.com and use code GREG21. Has there been, you know, uh, in your career and during your journey, any sort of and epic failures, any any sort of picture that got away because you, I don't know, back in the day of film, you know, you forgot to load a film or you were busy, <laughs> busy watching. Have you had any kind of like, oh, uh, shit, well, I'm in trouble? <laughs> the one Grand Prix race, we went to a nightclub the night 
that, and we left at three to go and have showers and go to the race. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. That was Canberra. It was a Grand Prix race. And um, I forgot to load film into the camera. So halfway through the bike, I'm going, this is a very long roll of film. And I'm on the back of the motorbike and then realise I haven't even loaded film into the camera. So, Oh, jeez. How did that feel? <laughs> I, shot the, I shot the crap out of the rest of the race to try and make up for it. <laughs> But uh, the people I was working for were at the same nightclub we were all at, so yeah, yeah. they kind of excused at that time. Um, no, monumental great. failures, I, I don't feel I have. Yes, mm. you miss a shot. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think I've failed in anything I've ever done. Um, mm. I'm proud of where I've got. I've made mistakes, and I don't think that's the same well, thing. Uh, well, mate, that's because you're a champion, because a champion never admits they really f- failed. They just always go, I learned, yeah, right? I mean, that's the I, kind of mindset. I, of, I of totally somebody. agree. I, I don't think mm. I've ever failed. As I said, the un- mm. that failure was was due to a you know, lack of sleep and uh, probably too much <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> but but you, you've also had sustained a few injuries. Tell, tell me a couple of those stories where you've maybe gotten a little too close. Um, injuries, injuries. Yeah, you you have the odd ball hit you or um, skateboard when I was doing extreme sports. Didn't you have a one in a bullfighting? Didn't the bull oh, almost kick okay. you? Okay, so going back to the fighting. old school the thing. Bull? Yeah, going back to the old school thing, I always wanted to shoot the running of the bulls. Um, mm. And I got the chance. I, I wasn't far from it, so I flew to the thing, got myself a media pass. I bluffed myself into a media pass. Um Again, didn't know much about it. So there were seven races in total. Um, it wasn't until about three or four I started getting comfortable with it. You know, I was mm. fearful of the bulls as well. I got into a position, a media position, which was deemed safe. Um, and I was lying on the ground to get a shot, a low angle. Um, and it was raining. It's the only bend on the course. So I'm trying to build it up here. There's only the only bend, so I put myself there. It had rained the night before, so the cobblestones were wet. And I thought, well, this might be a place where a ball might fall down, you know, maybe taking out, you know, other balls, etc. Well, one did slide, but and another ball came really wide to avoid it. Now, unbeknown to me, the fence that I was lying under was actually a gate. And it's a gate that they slam shut as the balls run past so they don't run backwards to along the course. Yeah. So this ball that went wide, um, went really wide and hit the fence. I was safe under the fence, but because it was a gate, his weight pushed it way back behind my shoulders. So my shoulders and head were exposed to the bulls, <laughs> um, which then the next ball that came past that went wide to avoid the fallen ball then clipped the camera that was, what, it's only five or six inches from my nose. Which, oh, jeez. It broke the lens um, and I laughed about it and giggled. And I thought, oh, that was a bit of fun. But I realised half an hour later I, I got the shakes and I realised that could have been my head that he took out and I could have been lying in a <laughs> in a Spanish hospital in a pretty bad way. Absolutely. So, you yeah. Got, you got a great shot from it though, didn't you? Sorry? Oh, I got You're the greatest a, picture it. from it, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I want that one. Can I put that on my show notes as well for okay, people to look yeah, at? Well, that, yeah, that shot won yeah. awards as well. And, oh, um, yeah. The I've Spanish people, one. which was nice, I learned something then. That I showed them a photo of a bull running at me and they went, no, the, the, the photo that you talk about is a better photo because the way it's been done, you can actually see the fear of the race, the people running. <laughs> and that's what it's about. It's not about the balls. It's about the people. So the Spanish people themselves told me that was the better picture. Mm-hmm. So I learned something from that that you you may shoot for your reasons and think this looks great, but when you talk to the person or the athlete, they'll go, no, this one's better because of this. So mm-hmm. um, there, there were many times in the extreme sports world I'd, I'd photograph a guy on a motorbike in a jump doing a trick. And I thought this is the best picture. Well, that's not – I was always told by the rider that that's not the best one because that's not the actual trick itself. And then he would show me this frame's better, but aesthetically that probably wasn't the pleasing one. Interesting. Mm. Yes, there's a little bit of what you see 
as a photographer and what they're trying to do in terms of a marketing, what they, how they're trying to market themselves. Absolutely, absolutely right. Mm-hmm. What 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 would you say has been some of, if you had to pick two or three of your favourite sort of images you've ever taken, whether they've had awards or not, is there anything that really stands out to you where you go, wow, that really is a special one? Or is it too, too many? <laughs> no, it's not too many. Um, hard to say, I, yeah. One one that comes to mind, and, and a lot of people have said it's probably the best triathlon photo ever, or in Iron Man particularly, mm. um, was the image of the, the – it was sunset at Iron Man WA and I was shooting people against the sunset as I traditionally would do and this gentleman stopped and was hunched over and he couldn't go on and um, – and, I, oh, this is a beautiful picture. It's a guy who's really struggling in the sun setting and you can see the metaphor building. Mm. Um, but he stopped there. He was halfway through the marathon run because his family were by the side of the road. His young little eight, nine-year-old girl came up and started holding his hand and going, Daddy, Daddy, you can do this. You can continue. Don't mm. stop. And he's, he's telling her, no, I'm done. I'm done. And the, the, I was at this point, it was hard for me to shoot because there were tears welling up in my eyes and I couldn't see, I couldn't see the picture through the viewfinder. So um, he did continue the race because of the, the young girl. Um, he, but his last half of his marathon went for three, four hours. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, he's, he took it. But the picture is the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a very athletic silhouette of a man who's hunched mm. bent over. You have the young, you know, child with the crossed legs and pleading to dad and the young silhouette and there's, the sun is setting in the back. And I knew that night I had a special picture and I took it back to the media room and everyone was gobsmacked. And the story behind it adds to it, obviously. Of course, but the story's already there, just in the image. You can see it. You, you can know, see it. I know the image you're talking yeah. about, and and even without you describing it, you can just see the image, and you can see what the young girl is saying to her dad, yeah. and, and and the power of those words. Yeah, you know, for for a dad to get that from your daughter, you know, it's kind of like yeah. okay, he couldn't, he I'm doing couldn't this for more up. than me. Yeah. This this is for this is bigger than just me. Yeah, um, I, I met yeah. him a few years later, and. He doesn't remember the moment. He he must have been in a bad way. Um, <laughs> he doesn't remember. He doesn't even remember the moment. So he sees the photo and he says, "No, I yeah. don't remember doing that." But yeah. um, you know, through the magic of Photoshop, I was able to see his number despite it being a silhouette. And we looked him up, and yeah, he doesn't remember it. So he was in a bad way. Good on you. Good on you. But even no, as what? I said, other moments like Emma. You know, crossing the Simon crossing the line at the Olympics, mm. and you know when friends have done it, they all become memorable pictures in my world. Of course, of course. I mean, you have such a collection um, yeah. of just wonderful images where the timing has just been right and the angles, and you know, one of my favourites, and it's 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 amusing, but it's it's just very clever. Is the the one with the the Olympic uh, table tennis, yeah, where the ball just sits right between his eyes. Um, See, that, that's just, a story again in itself that I, I went and photographed table tennis and as I was leaving, I got nothing that day. And as I was leaving, I watched the guy serve and I saw the ball pass his face like that. And I went, mm-hmm. oh, that'll make an interesting picture. So I waited four years for the next Olympics. That was my <laughs> next opportunity to shoot table tennis. Wow. And I said, I'm going to get that picture. And I sat there the whole day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, I, that was my fourth frame of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd actually got it, you know, within the first few minutes. But I said, "No, I'll get one better than that." And I spent the whole day shooting this picture. And um, people thought I was a bit weird doing what I was doing. I was sitting in one spot with one lens, trying to get this picture. And um, yeah, that was four years in the making. I thought about that picture for four years That's to do it. Fantastic! Yeah, that is. I like. I really like. And you, you must have got an award for that one. I did, did get an award for that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was a People's Choice Award. I remember that. Yeah, it's just that's an outstanding shot. Now I want to ask you a question: that um, digital versus film. Sure. Now, before you answer, I have my own take on it because 
I don't rem- know if you remember when we used to do the New Balance Japan yep. team triathlon team photo shoots, and um, we do the New Balance Japan uh, catalog mm. as, a, as, a, as a team. And those catalogs used to take us about five days, mm. you know, run throughs, run through, put on a new outfit, run through, run through, run through. And then digital came one year. Yep. And you turned up and doot, 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 Greg, you're done next. Yep. And I think we were done in one day or yep. whatever it was. It was unbelievably how it changed the world. Mm. But I guess the question for you is, has there been any negatives going digital? Do you miss film? I I missed film because I was so good at it. Um, I guess that was one of my strengths and people would hire me knowing that. I knew how film behaved, um, how a different type of film would behave in different light, um, how to expose it properly. So that was one of my strengths early on. Um, but do I, I also, as I said, doing this archiving last year, I realised the quality of film. Um, mm. I look at some of those pictures and they're outstanding, the quality. And digital's only just got there. So digital's been going from the early 2000s. So That's it's right. taken 20 years for them to, I think, finally match the quality of film. Mm. Um, but do I miss it in a work sense? Probably not. No. Um, I can see what picture I, I've got and I can move on. I can get more done in a day. Um, now what I do miss after a triathlon, we used to go to the pub, but because film was about to be sent off and get processed and you, you didn't get it until two or three days later. Nowadays I'm spending three or four hours after a race, sending it off to Instagrams and whatever for everybody else. So that's changed. Um, but the workflow is much, much easier now. And I guess as I get older, I get a bit lazier. So, um, well, we all do, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what this show is about. Is like how do we make it easier? Yeah, digital's <laughs> made it easy in that respect. Um, yeah, I it, mean, talk it's about, a good about uh, t- talking about age. I mean, you, you mentioned that. Mm. I mean, you're lugging. How heavy is that gear? And, and before you even answer this, how are you preparing yourself for these long days, whether it's an Ironman or triathlon or swimming? Lugging all your gear around, is there any kind of preparation you're doing uh, physically or anything? Because yeah, how heavy I, is, is there it? is a lot of working smarter, not harder scenario mm. at the moment. Um, thankfully, the gear is getting lighter. I mean, they've worked out their optics and a few other things that it's not as heavy. But um, now the working smarter thing is that I can go to an event and go, well, I don't need this particular lens. I won't use it. So that of course. stays at home and a few other things as well. Um, mm. Yeah, I I will always behave before a race and rest properly and eat properly and make sure that I'm ready to roll. An Ironman day, I'll make sure, you know, out of the 12 to 16-hour day that I have that I stop and have lunch with my bike, you know, my motorbike driver and a few other things. Mm. You know, I mm. may spend an hour having lunch with him but – um, by the end of the day, I'm you know I've got food in my belly and drink, and I've had a bit of a rest. Mm. And it's hard. You sit there for an hour, going, "Oh my god, what if something's happening in the race?" <laughs> the, the biggest thing of the day is happening. Yeah, it's right happening, now. and yeah, I'm not yeah. there. But um, but you need to do these things, or, or stop by an aid station and grab a cookie and and a bit of Gatorade. Good on you. I yeah. love that. Yeah, but it, <laughs> is it is a lot of working smarter, not harder. For our for our techie listeners that are into you know photography what what's your go-to camera that you use you know most of the time is there one that stands yeah, out I, I mean i've been a nikon boy from the beginning so it i i stay with that system they're a wonderful system it's all familiarity right you, you're used to it mm. you, you know where the buttons oh. are but i've been to nikon japan and um being a japanese company you just realize how proud they are of that name you know, and there's no one working in that company that want to produce a bad product. They want the best product and the best product in the world. You know, you go to the Nikon Museum and you just see the stuff that they've done. It's, mm. it's a very big name in Japanese culture, in Japanese photography, and in photography in general. So, 
Yeah, they've just brought out the D6, um, which mm-hmm. is digital camera number six, the pro camera. It, mm-hmm. They brought it out for the Olympics that were meant to be last year. Um, I had it sitting in a box for 11 months, but I've been using it now, and it's a, it's a beast of a camera. It's a is sports it really? photographer's camera. It's like it was meant for the Olympics. It's meant for, for Delhi um, or That's all awesome. the other Delis around the world. Are you giving them feedback? Is that part of your that, being an that ambassador? That was at the start, yeah. For yeah. a lot of cameras, particularly those they feel are sports photographers' cameras, they'll always send out a prototype and have me play with it, um, mm. give them feedback. Yeah, they. I'm blessed like that. They they do ask for what I think. Well, of course, they're going to ask what the best. Yeah, that's, that's funny. That's they, the they, works, sometimes, <laughs> they sometimes look at me strange and go, because they do put a lot of bells and whistles on, which I may not use. And it yeah. I try to, I work on that keep it simple principle. Mm-hmm. Um, so they go, well, why don't you use that? And well, it just complicates it. Well, for me, it does. Yeah, but yeah, yeah they yeah. do. They, they respect me. I, I think um, I'm a Nikon ambassador for Australia, but I think they treat me as the number one sports ambassador around the world for many things that I do for them. They, They'll keep coming back to me, oh, and that's a blessing. I don't blame them. Yeah, I don't blame them. Thank mate. You. I, I really, I think if I was in that world, I'd be reaching out to you as well. Thank um, you. But look, I want to finish off with a couple of questions, and then some, we'll have some fun rapid fire questions Ooh, just to really okay. finish off. But a couple of uh, more more on the serious questions here. Um, I just want one bit of advice that you might have for people that are, are wanting to follow their passion. Um, if, if that can, I mean, it's not a, a, a small question, I guess. It's kind of a, a big one depending on what the passion mm. is. But what's that sort of one bit of advice you'd give for people that, I don't know, are, are sitting at that office desk, <laughs> they, they're working in, in marketing or, mm. you know, whatever field like you were. Is there any advice that you could yeah. give them? You, you've got to be, you have to be a good person in general. You've got to be um, mm. a good business person. People are only going to deal with you if they like you. And so um, am I saying this right? You I don't need know to be a good change, person. Can they change their can they change can somebody change their who they are enough? <laughs> well, I don't know, mm-hmm. hard to say, but yeah, well yeah. then whatever yeah. you, your personality is, make it your strength in some way or form. I like that. Uh, yeah, you've got to yeah. turn it around and I guess mm-hmm. it's marketing. Um, well it's having good manners. It's I mean, yeah, good manners, everything else, but if your strength is whatever, well, if you feel that you're this type of person or this type of athlete or this type of creative, then make it your strength in some way or form. Um, mm, mm. That's the right choice of words, the right choice of marketing, etc. But, but hey, you know, passion, you know, always kind of wins out. You've really got to go for it. You just can't mm. stop giving up. How, how is your passion been over the last 35 years How, have you had some pretty long down times uh, i know as an athlete i you know you had long periods where I'm like oh maybe i should just stop have you had moments um and, and my, my passion for my work has never has never wavered it, it's gotten stronger i mean the time that i got sick um at the race in canada was mm-hmm. a time where i was off work for 12 months um um I really did miss the sport and um, at the time, you know, the, the amount of messages that I got from people I, I, after rehab and a few other things, I I came back to 2,000 messages from people around the world, athletes, administrators, technical mm. officials that, I, that were wishing me the best. So, yeah, I, that probably built on my passion that I wanted to come back to work. Um, last mm. year was tough. Um, I, I, there were a lot of things I did enjoy, but I, do we want last year again? None of us ever do, but there were things that I learned and things that I did. And, but yeah, my passion to go back to work was there. I still wanted to go back to work. I wanted to pick up the camera again. I love it. Yeah. So it, um, it's gotten stronger because I know in my world, my creative brain, you know, people say, Delhi, when are you putting out the book? And I said, well, I'm not putting out a book until I actually stop work <laughs> because my work, my best work is about to come. 
Of course. Right? It, it's been getting stronger from day one and, and I'm not at day end right now. So my best work will be the next few years. If we, if we throw in that Tari photo of 89, that could have been your best. <laughs> well, well <laughs> it's going to be a thing for – I might throw it in there, yeah, maybe. If you throw, maybe. Maybe. If you <laughs> no, I don't take a very pretty picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll try and, and find a pretty photo of you. And yeah, that's all right, well, mate. I there were a couple hope, of good ones. Even if I'm just in the background of Laura, that'll do. <laughs> hey, there was also the year after Tari, and I've pulled up next to you on the motorbike, and you've gone and given me a wedgie. So <laughs> you, get, you get thrown off the course for that. <laughs> you do exactly. <laughs> it's funny, buddy, that particularly in the sport of triathlon, that. Um, we all became friends so much that I try to take pictures of you guys doing your thing and you pull faces and do silly yeah. things. And I'm going, no, that's, that's not what I want. I want you guys to. But it's for you, <laughs> wedgies and, and tongues yeah. out and so forth. That was hilarious. Well, remember Matt Harris? You remember Matt yeah. Harris? He and then he got yeah, DQ'd. And he got DQ'd at Foster Chung yeah. Curry. He came through on, was it the second lap of three or something on the bike? And Yep. He uh, he dropped his dax. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, had, he, he was riding his bike and he had his uh, yeah. swimsuit down behind the seat and uh, went around the, the the corner there. And I think yeah, did he finish? I don't know if he finished, Matt. If you're listening, but uh, <laughs> I know he got DQ'd the poor guy. <laughs> and everyone loved it. Yeah, everyone loved, everyone it. loved it. But yeah, yeah. It, it's it's funny. I I and in swimming it happens now that I I'll get a silly face and all that sort of stuff. So. Mm. Um, but but that's a, that's a compliment to me as well, and I love it. Of course, it. you're everybody's mate. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's almost like once you're a mate with Delhi Car, it means you've made it. <laughs> that's you know not I mean? true. But anyway, yeah. Get, yeah. I'm, anyway, I'm, the, I'm the one who's who's gobsmacked that I I get to hang out with all these great athletes and gold medalists and you know, no, you, wow! I, I was never a sportsman, but I I'm there with them. I'm I'm having dinner with you know some of the greats in sport. It's wonderful. That's kind of how I feel with this show when I, oh, wow. I reach out to someone like you or, or any athlete or entertainer or whoever I'm, I'm speaking to and they say yes. Mm. Like, wow, I get to have a conversation with so-and-so. This and this. Yeah. I mean, I go up and, you know, I tell Laura, I'm like, I can't believe this person's saying yes. Or, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, Funny. it's always a bit gobsmacked because I am such a fan of uh, the people I get to do this sure. show with. Um, so here's a question on that line. and <coughs> If you could sit and have a coffee – with any living person, who would it be and why? Living, living, living. Ah, oh, there are a lot of dead ones. Um, <laughs> well, we can have a dead one. Dead one? And Muhammad Ali. Definitely. Okay. Oh, yeah. imagine having coffee with that bloke. Um, yeah. Living, living. George Clooney. Interesting. Big fanboy. Um, oh, hmm. oh, a lot of dead ones. Elvis, Michael Jackson. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You're just showing your age, that's all. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> They're good ones. I've, I like every one you've yeah. mentioned. So, um, Michelangelo. Okay, now we're really going back. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm not that old. But they, yeah, um, if one person, Muhammad Ali, definitely. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Gosh, he, he knew. He, yeah, was, he um, walked the walk and talked the talk. He was great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, did everything. Matched it. All right, let's finish off the show, and this is a bit of fun. Yep. Um, so 15 fun rapid-fire questions. 15, serious? Well, no, you can say pass, okay. but this is fast Twitch fiber stuff, mate. Here we go. Okay, and start with some softball ones. What is your favorite family vacation? The entrance central coast in in um, New South Wales. Beautiful. It's about an hour and a half north of yeah. Sydney. Yeah. Beautiful part of the world. Good memories. Um what event would you love to photograph but haven't had the opportunity? Tour de France. Really? You haven't had the opportunity for the Tour I de France? I had the opportunity and I gave up on it. Um, mm. Another big miss was I had the opportunity to shoot Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls in their heyday and I went, no, I'll do it another day. Oh, ouch. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you change about yourself if you could? Um, 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 um <laughs> You can say nothing. My procrastination. <laughs> your what? My procrastination with answering oh, that question. Bit. Okay, yeah. Okay, here we go. On a scale of one to ten, how cool are you? Nine. No, I agree. I was going to give you a ten. <laughs> I'm the coolest Anybody old bloke on the around planet. in full black with black shades <laughs> and a black cool helmet. Absolutely. During Kona summer. <laughs> yeah. When I get the Harley, I'll go to ten. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's a really good one for you. What's the largest animal you could wrestle to the floor? Oh, shit, no. Um, <laughs> zero. I can't. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I can't do it. And my son who's writing to animals and doing uh, zoo studies would not let me touch one. What about just wrestling like a, a pygmy possum to the uh, ground? Uh, yeah, pig. I'd love, a, I'd love to <laughs> wrestle a pig in the mud. You don't have to, is it? It's just if you have to, <laughs> if we put you in a ring with someone, who do you, th- do you think you could take them down? No, not at all. <laughs> okay, here's a, a more serious one. Outside of photography, if you could choose to do anything for a day, what would it be? Uh, um, I'd, I'd love to be a drummer in a rock band. Mm, I could see you doing that. Mm. Um, okay, which would you rather do? Wash dishes, mow the lawn, clean the bathroom, or vacuum the house. Oh, shit. No, uh, no, I'll wash the dishes because mum and dad. None of the above. <laughs> <laughs> None of the above. Mum and dad made me do the dishes when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, here's, uh, who would you want to play you in a movie of your life? George Clooney. Yeah, you already mentioned yeah. him. Very good. Um, which decade of music is the best? 70s. Yeah, it's, it's a toss-up between 70s and 80s. Yeah, me, but- yeah. Yeah, five years, the end of the 70s, five years into the 80s. It's funny, isn't it? You know, with, with my kids, all they get is, you know, on Pandora, I type in, you know, Cat Stevens or John Denver <laughs> or, or just 80s or whatever it Absolutely. is. Absolutely. And, and all the music they know now. Yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's good. When, my, my kids used to love Stairway to Heaven. Oh, yeah, yeah of they course. Used to, and they were four-year-olds singing Stairway to Heaven. I went, Am I blessed? What beautiful children. My, my, my three-year-old has memorized um, Piano Man. Oh. And and this is a and um, waltzing Matilda. Wow, oh, beautiful! Which is I had and to learn the a good song. Yeah. yeah. Well, living in America, we had to learn the Australian proper, probably proper anthem. Yep. Anyway, where are we at? Um, number ten. If you had a time machine, would you travel to the future or back to the past? Back to the past. How far back? Um, back to my life starting again. <laughs> You don't want to do it all again, do you? You don't want to do it all again. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm exhausted. The idea of doing it again. <laughs> um, all right. How far back? Uh, if I was to go back further, I'd love the old happy days, 50s, 60s in the American thing. Mm. I would go I like back that. there. Very cool. The Fonz. Yep. All right. Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? I'd love that question. And um, my daughter's vegetarian, so... What's politically correct? <laughs> I'd say pass. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> that was way out there, that one. I like yeah, it. You like that. Good. If you had to describe yourself as an animal, which one would it be? A pig in mud. <laughs> Why a pig? I love pigs. Oh, that's great. I love pigs. Oh, I think I, I, Hey, retirement, you could see me as a pig farmer in the Blue Mountains, mate. All right. I like that idea, yeah, mate. I, I, could, cool. I could do pigs, definitely. All right. Number 13, number one pet peeve. Pet peeve? Oh, it's not with my pet. Not pets, but, you know. Pet peeve. Of, um, people not doing their job properly. Yeah, that's yeah. more than just um, pet peeve. Incompetence. Yeah, yeah. And very that, good. That seems like the world and service and everything has just oh. gone downhill. Mate, bike industry was always like that. And people um, have no spatial awareness, like the people that go up an elevator, uh, escalator, and then at the top yeah. of the escalator stop and other people go from behind. <laughs> or you know one that pisses me off the most? Standing doorways. Is the baggage claim. Yep, yeah, those people. people have to go right up to the – just stand back and when your bag comes up, Move walk up. forward and yep. get it. No spatial awareness. Ah, clueless. All right, here we go. Here's a bigger one. Proudest moment of your life? Um, my children, watching them grow. Um, right. Yeah, just, you know, yours are a lot younger than mine, but, mate, there's so many stages yet to come. Mm-hmm. And now I've got mm-hmm. young adults and I'm watching them step up. So, yeah, I'm sure children, you definitely. That's brilliant. Yep. Okay, last one. Um <laughs> If you won $100 million in the lottery, tax-free, mm. how would you spend it? Um, yeah, I, my number one thing is, is buy a massive farm somewhere. Um, Good. Yeah. Nice. I think Sarah um, True said the same thing last yeah, week. Yeah, I, I'd, 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 as, as wonderful as Sydney is um, and as beautiful as it is and 
Australia is the most beautiful country in the world. I would go out and live on a farm and, and raise the pigs that I've just spoke about. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love yeah, it. And, and set up a massive studio there and just do creative stuff. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I feel like I'm the only one that has an actual spreadsheet for this for when I do win. Oh, okay. You know? um, really no, I'm not a, see, I'm not very good at the maths, so I'm not, I'm spreadsheet's not going to happen. <laughs> mate, Delhi, this has been fantastic, yeah. mate. Thanks so much Thank for you. just Greg, you know, like coming I said, on. I stopped doing all these podcasts and things, and it's wonderful to be asked by people, but I stopped mid-year last year. Um, mm. I just didn't feel up to it anymore. But mm. when you asked me, it was, yes, it's, it was a definite. I actually said effing yes, right? You did. Yes, you did. So, and, um, and it didn't surprise me at all. It was a deli response that yeah, I expected. It, it's it was, something it was, that, no, uh, you know, we talked no. about the 80s and 90s um, where we were a band of brothers. So, yeah, if mm. you need something, I, I'd, I'd fly over and give it to you or whatever it is. And you, Vice you versa, were, mate. You are one of the first person people to see me when I got sick. So, um, when you said it, it, I said, definitely, I'm doing it no matter what. And um, no, so it was a definite pleasure for me as well. And I was hoping Laura would be there as well and we could speak together. But you'll give her my love, I'm sure. I'm warming her up. I'm, I've actually gone and bought uh, microphones and headphones for her and, and I'm trying to see if we get her on the show in this next month. That's my <laughs> plan. Um, I figure if I go buy expensive equipment and, and everything else, she'll be, oh, she'll okay, be impressed. Okay. more obliged. <laughs> so we'll have to do this show again in a few months, mate. Even though you, you've said no to podcast, I'd be like, hey, redo. Um, but, mate, this really has been fantastic. Thank you. And just some of those stories and your knowledge and, and just a wonderful journey. Um, yeah. Just a, a tremendous I'm very, story. very lucky that, you know, I walked into a triathlon in 1988 to take some pictures and it has defined my life. It's changed my life. I can't mm. imagine my life without it. Have you got time for an interesting fact? Yeah, go on. Um, I've, I worked out just prior to winning an award at, at a speech I had to do, but I had to. I worked out that I've spent roughly seven to eight years of my life at a triathlon. So if wow. you count all the days and if I got in a car now to shoot a triathlon, I don't come back for another eight years. I'd be at a triathlon every day. How many events is that? Do you know how many actual oh, races? I, I, don't, that I don't have the numbers in front of me. But I, that was on averages and how many races I do yeah, yeah, yeah. how many wow. years I've been at it. I've been doing it for 35, 36 years. Right. So it, yeah, you're it part comes, of the furniture now. You're part of the furniture no a, matter what. It's seven or eight years of my life I've given to the sport. My yeah, family sport, haven't seen me for, for Yeah, my family have let me run free for eight years. Out of the 35? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's bigger, that's, right? Oh, that's amazing, isn't, isn't it? it? When you what start doing numbers but, like you know, that, I've been blessed that I walked in a triathlon and triathlon walked into my life as well. So, well, the sport's been better for Thank it, and you. you're completely blessed by, by having you. Where can um, you know people follow you? Where where are some of your handles? And um, well, website to some of the images and stuff. Yeah, sportsphotography.com.au. Don't know how I got that website, but I did. Um, mm -hmm. It's my thing. But uh, at Delhi Photo Ninja, Delhi Photo Ninja. <laughs> It's my Instagram. <laughs> That's the one I put most effort in. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not on Twitter anymore, but and Facebook I don't love, but Instagram's where you'll see my best pictures. Perfect. Yeah. Well, mate, I'll put all of that in the the show notes for people to find. Um, thank you everybody for listening and everybody for sharing the show and all the feedback. Um, like I said, you can find all of that in the show notes and timestamps and all the links, coupon codes and everything at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Deli, thanks again, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you, dude. All right. We'll stay catch on up soon, eh? Yeah, we will. Cheers. Stay Bye -bye. Thanks a lot for listening to Be With Champions. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Be With Champions Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.